Hi, I'm Brian Green and I'm a water quality scientist with Utah State University Water Quality Extension and we're here by the Logan River in Cache County to talk about some common water quality tests that scientists use to judge the health of our clean water and streams and lakes. Um, these are types of tests that students can even do um, by themselves with teachers and we're going to show you how to do them so that you can have uh, the knowledge and the skills to be able to properly perform on the Envirothon test. The aquatic station is one of the normal stations at the Utah Envirothon. And so by practicing these before you get to the Envirothon, you'll have better knowledge and better skills about why we do these tests and also how to do them uh, in the field. You can do these at any small to uh, medium sized streams or rivers here in Utah. One of the most important things though we want to stress is safety. Safety is always most important when you're taking students out or taking people outside to go to do water quality measurements. And so we want to make sure that um, you've scouted out an area beforehand, make sure that you have easy access to it, and also make sure that you pay attention for the things like the weather and the conditions of, of the streams. You never want to be out during high water. You never want to be out during really large flows. They can be really dangerous. And so safety is our most important things. If it's greater than one feet deep and flowing faster than one foot per second, you don't want to have anybody in the water. So um, those are important things to remember, but most of the times you can come out and you'll be able to safely and easily do these measurements and they're also a lot of fun to take people out to a great location like one of these streams we have here. Oftentimes we talk about the quantity of the water because we're in the second driest state in the nation. But one thing that's important to remember is that you can have the large amounts of polluted dirty water and it doesn't matter. It's really the, we need clean, healthy water for all of our beneficial uses. The farmers need clean water, our towns and cities need it for the drinking water, and the wildlife and animals need to have clean water. So it's important to remember that keeping our streams and lakes healthy and clean benefits everybody in Utah. So in these series of videos, we'll show you some ways to monitor water quality. All of these methods have lesson plans, have diagrams, and have videos on them associated with our website. So if you go to streamsidescience.usu.edu, you'll be able to find all of these resources on there. We've aligned many of our lesson plans to the core curriculum, so you can find what age is appropriate to use for and what core standards that these meet. I'm Jacob Stout, and I'm a student here at Utah State University studying water quality. Streamflow is an important uh, part of a, ri of a river system. Um, one of the things is we need to know how much water is in the river to be able to divvy it up for water rights. We need to be able to keep enough water in the stream for uh, fish and aquatic species to live in. But yet we still need to be able to pull out enough water um, to be able to use on our farms and for mun municipal and industrial uses and whatever else um, we decide to use the water with. Discharge is also important at being able to measure floods and how large a flood will be and what impacts it will have on the surrounding flood plains and, and communities um, surrounding a river. Uh, it's uh, important for being able to transport um, sediments and rocks and gravels and stuff like that, which are important for, um, for stream channel formation and for um, some aquatic species. Okay, here we're gonna be measuring stream flow discharge. Uh, discharge is a measurement of volume over time. Uh, a lot of times w this is, can be expressed as cubic feet per second or cubic meters per second. Here in the United States, cubic feet per second is a very um, standard unit. So a cubic foot, for those of you who would like a better description, a cubic foot you can imagine is it's like a basketball and so when we're looking here at a river we're trying to imagine how many basketballs are flowing past a certain point on the river at over a certain time so here on the river what we're wanting to do is is get those two measurements of a, of a volume over time so we'll measure the width of the river we'll get an average depth of the river and then we'll want to find out um, an average velocity um, which is a length per time. So today we're going to use two methods of measuring discharge. One is a more simple way. Um, 
The equipment that you'll need is a ping pong ball, a yardstick, and a tape measure. Um, the way that we'll do this is we'll get our, our width um, using the tape measure, and then with the yardstick or whatever um, measuring device, we'll get our we'll do a few measurements across the river to get an average depth. And then with the ping pong ball, we'll start up, upstream and we'll let the we'll start in a spot that's representative of the flow, and we'll let the ping pong ball flow down to get the surface water velocity. Um, that length is is 50 feet, and we'll time that we'll time the length from the moment that we release the ping pong ball to the time that it reaches the end of the 50 feet. Another way that we'll be measuring discharge is using this more sophisticated and expensive probe. Um, this is a flow meter and it's designed to be able to measure um, velocity. What we do is we, we find, uh, we stretch a tape across the stream channel and then this one you take measurements of, of depth and then at each of those measurements, you put the probe into the water and move it around um, and it will integrate the water velocity at that point. And then we'll repeat that process several times across the, the water channel to get a representative um, flow velocity. So here the idea is that we want to get little sections of the river across across the river to get a more accurate measurement. And we're, you know, you get a small measurement of width, a small measurement of depth, and then that velocity. And then at the end, you add all of those up to get the stream flow, velo the stream flow velocity um, and discharge. Here, um, it's, it's typical that we use about 20 measurements of discharge uh, across the stream, depending on the stream size. My name is Tim Beach and I'm a student at Utah State University studying watershed sciences and water quality. So now we're going to talk about macroinvertebrates, aquatic macroinvertebrates and how uh, they're indicators of water quality. So macroinvertebrate uh, is a long word but if you split it up into two words macro and invertebrate it's a little bit easier to understand. So macro means large enough that you can see with your eye and then invertebrate uh, means as an organism that doesn't have a backbone. So these organisms live in the water, uh, they don't have a backbone, and they're large enough that you can see with your naked eye. So macroinvertebrates are important for a few reasons. Uh, they're a big food source for, for uh, fish and for other animals that live in the water. Um, for, so for, uh, if you're going fishing, you're looking for trout, you're also looking for macroinvertebrates because they're the food source for for these fish and they're also good uh, for indicating uh, how much oxygen is in the water, uh, for the pH levels in the water and so it's really awesome because you can get a sample of macroinvertebrates and it can tell you a whole lot of different things about uh, the water quality and the, water, the status of the water. So these guys have unique life stages so they start in the water and then they they have a different life stage or adult stage outside of the water. So these guys, I kind of like to think about them as butterflies. So we know everyone knows that, uh, that they start out as caterpillars and they change into a butterfly. So these guys live in the water and then they change into an adult stage that flies, similar to a butterfly. So many people think of monitoring water quality with probes or collecting water samples. But this way, uh, monitoring, monitoring aquatic macroinvertebrates is more of a biological way of monitoring. So when you come out, you're going to collect a sample of these aquatic macroinvertebrates and then you're going to assess um, uh, how large they are, how many, they are, how many of them there are, how, like, how diverse they are, how many, how many different species there are, and that could be an indicator of how clean the water is. Uh, some of them are more sensitive than others, so if you see more sensitive ones in aquatic environments then you can tell that uh, it's, a, it's really good water quality. Right, these macroinvertebrates live in different habitats within the river, so there's lots of different uh, rocks and uh, sand habitats so th throughout the river. So pick a, uh, a habitat on the side, in the middle, maybe in a deeper pool and in a riffle. Just make sure that you're, you're getting a representative sample. Collecting aquatic macroinvertebrates is pretty, a pretty simple process. So you're going to need a few different things. The first thing that you'll need is a net to collect the macroinvertebrates and you can uh, use different kinds of nets. And so this is a simple one that you can create on your own. Uh, we just use two dowel rods 
and then some window screening uh, tied in between these two. And so this is one that you can make at home, you can take out into the river and collect pretty easily. And so, uh, so you can use this kind of net and then there's also another kind of net that you can use, a more professional net that costs a little bit more money. Um, it has uh, this fine netting on the bottom and then a sturdy, sturdy handle up here. So either way, you, you're, uh, you're going to collect some good macroinvertebrates with these. And so uh, after you collect them in your net, you're going to need to put them in a bin. And so we just have these kind of uh, typical Tupperware that you can put in there. Uh, make sure it's filled up with water. Uh, these guys need to stay in water to stay alive. So fill this up um, and then you can put your macroinvertebrates in there. And then after you have them in your bin, you're going to want to look at them a little more closely. So some tools that can help you out with that. Uh, we have uh, Petri dishes, pipettes, and then uh, just like a magnifying glass, you can put these uh, macroinvertebrates in your Petri dish and you can suck up the little ones and uh, put them in there so you can examine it a little bit more. So many aquatic macroinvertebrates live uh, on the rocks and riffles. So it's one of their uh, favorite habitats. So these guys live on uh, the rocks because there's a lot of dissolved oxygen. There's a lot of places that they can hide uh, from predators. And so you'll find a lot of them on, on larger rocks or smaller rocks. And sometimes you can even go out into the river and just pick up a rock and you can see them living on, living on the rocks there. Okay, so we're unwinding our net. And then we're going to want to put it on the bottom of the stream to make sure that we capture all of the macroinvertebrates that are, are flowing down into the, into the net. So the next step is uh, kind of a river dance to kick up all the, the different macroinvertebrates that are living on the rocks. So someone's going to have to come up and step in front of the net and kick up some rocks. So the last step is uh, picking up all the things that you've collected. So all the leaves and macroinvertebrates. So the last thing that we want to do is to empty out all of the insects and stuff that we have in our net. And so you're going to want to put it, kind of empty it, and, uh, put it upside down and then uh, filter water through it so it kind of washes everything off the net. So we have a lot of uh, detritus, we have a lot of uh, leaves and moss and stuff in here, but there's a lot of macroinvertebrates in here as well. So um, we've gone through and we've taken our uh, petri dishes and we've collected some of the macroinvertebrates with our pipettes and just kind of scooping them up into our petri dishes. So here's an example of some of the macroinvertebrates that we've caught in the Logan River. So we have some scuds here. These guys are tolerant to pollution and so you'll see these guys in, uh, in rivers and streams and, and some ponds and lakes that, uh, that have pollution in them. So this macroinvertebrate that we've collected is a mayfly. These guys have three tails, um, they swim like dolphins, so they're pretty cool to watch. And uh, these guys are a little more uh, sensitive to pollution. You find them in areas uh, with high oxygen and uh, it's a relatively clean river. Okay, the last example we have is a, is a caddisfly we've found. Caddisflies build their cases with uh, sometimes silk and, and sometimes uh, or things they find in the river. So caddisflies are also a sensitive species. Uh, they're sensitive to pollution and uh, they also live their, their life cycle in the river uh, or their, uh, their juvenile stage in the river and then transform it to the adult. Uh, we could probably tell that, this, that the Logan River at this point is probably it's pretty good condition but might have some pollution in it. The last thing that you're going to want to do before you head out is take these macroinvertebrates and put them back into the water body that you found them so they can uh, continue to live on. So some of these macroinvertebrates are a little hard to identify. Uh, so if you go onto our website, we have some tools to help you identify which type of macroinvertebrates you're finding. Um, there's some of these dichotomous keys uh, or different charts that you can look at to see um, uh, which ones have, they go through like which ones have legs, no legs, and they'll help you identify uh, which ones are, are um, can live in good water quality and some that, that live in not so good water quality. So uh, these are just some tools that you can use to help you, uh, help you in, your, in your quest to, to get some macroinvertebrates. Hi, I'm Ellen Bailey. I'm a water quality scientist at the USU Water Quality Extension. And uh, I'm going to talk about uh, how we measure nitrates and why we care about them. Uh, they're an important chemical indicator of water quality. So nitrogen is an important chemical in the water and we care about it because when you get too much of it, 
Um, in the water body, it can cause excessive growth of algae and plants, which um, starts eating up the oxygen in the water. Um, so you can get a drop in dissolved oxygen, which is bad for fish and other organisms that use oxygen. Nitrogen is naturally occurring in these water bodies, but we can get excess amounts from agriculture or septic systems, and it can move easily in the surface and groundwater. So there's different ways that we can measure nitrates in the water. We've got here this simple kit that we use. It's a Chemetrix nitrate kit. And there's a simple instruction sheet um, that will show you how to go through the process. So this kit has a um, has an amp uh, vial that we collect the water in. And um, there's a chemical cadmium that you would put into the water and that has a chemical reaction with the nitrate that will change the color to pink depending on how much nitrate you have in the water. So we're going to collect some water into this vial, but before we do, we want to rinse it in the stream. So we're going to put 15 mils of water into the vial. So you can just fill it up and then just um, dump it down till it's at 15 mils. The next step is to add the cadmium packet to the water. This is a chemical, is poisonous, so you don't want to open it with your teeth. You can either tear it or use some scissors. And then you can just dump it into the water. And then you want to make sure that you put this in your waste container. So after you've shaken it vigorously for three minutes, you'll want it to sit for 30 seconds to settle. After you've shaken it for three minutes, you'll want to grab one of these ampules that comes in the kit. You place it into the vial against there's little ridges in there and give it a little bit of pressure and the tip will break and the ampule will fill up with water with a little air bubble. Um, so you can turn it a few times and it will mix. Um, during this whole process, you want to make sure and keep it out of the sun because this, uh, if you leave it in the sun, that'll react with the color and you won't get a full, full color change. So you want to make sure you're doing this test in the shade. When you're ready to dump the vial, you want to make sure and put it into the waste container. So now that we've waited 10 minutes for a color change, we're going to compare it with our chart that we have over here. Uh, this goes from zero to three milligrams per liter, which is milligrams per liter is our normal uh, measurement for nitrates. Um, it can also be uh, referred to as parts per million ppm. And so you can see that we haven't had much of a color change, but that's kind of pretty typical for a Utah stream. The rivers are naturally low in most areas in nitrates, and so it's really not showing much of a change at all, but that doesn't mean that there's no zero nitrates in the water. It's just too low to detect using this method. Once you're up in the three milligrams per liter range, that can be really a cause for concern. Um, drinking water standards are at 10 milligrams per liter, but about three is when it might start affecting um, the macroinvertebrates in the water or some of the wildlife. After you're done um, with the vial, we'll put it into the waste container and make sure it ends up in the trash. Hi, I'm Brian Green, and I'm a water quality scientist with Utah State University Water Quality Extension. Today, we're gonna to be talking about one of the oldest and most important measurements that you can do on a lake or reservoir. They're called a secchi disc, which is a measurement of water clarity or turbidity, showing how much suspended material, be it sediment, uh, plant material like algae is in the water column. The secchi disc is one of our oldest and most important measurements for lakes. It's a white and black disc that's eight inches in diameter that you lower into the water 
to see how clear it is. If the water is really clear, you can lower it down much further. If the water is very turbid or cloudy, you won't be able to lower it down as far and still be able to see this. Um, a Secchi disc, S-E-C-C-H-I, is invented by Pietro Angelo Secchi, an Italian scientist in the 1800s. Uh, I always like to tell students, if you ever invent something, name it after yourself. That way people will be talking about you over 200 years later. So it's a good, really easy way to get a lot of measurements. This has been one of the most used water quality parameters all throughout the world. People have been taking discs like this, dropping them down into lakes and the oceans to being able to see how clear the water is. And it can provide us information about runoff, about nutrient inputs, about the trophic state or how productive a lake or reservoir is. And so it's really simple to do. Um, the key thing is you need to have access to deep water. So you need to either do this off a pier like we're doing here at Cutler Reservoir or off a boat. Um, another good thing is doing it during the middle of the day when the sun is high up overhead so it provides you uh, good visibility to be able to, to see. So we're going to go over the official method for how we do this in the state of Utah. Different states, different areas might have different methods. Some discs are all white, some have different shapes, but um, this is the one that we use here in Utah. It's important to remember not to be wearing your special polarized glasses because those help you see further down into the water. So how you do this test is you come out to where your monitoring location will be and then you are going to take the disc which is attached to a measuring tape either in meters or in feet and you're going to slowly lower it down in the water and you're going to lower it down until you can't see any of the white and black markings and then you're going to slowly move it up so you can just start to faintly see. As soon as you can faintly see that white and black outline, you're then able to go and mark the surface of the water and see how deep down the disc is underneath there. That gives you a good measurement of the water clarity in the column of the lake or reservoir. One important thing to remember when you're using the Secchi disc is if you're in a more shallow location that you don't want to let it go all the way down to where it hits the bottom of the, the sediment. Sometimes that can release a plume up which can make it uh, extra cloudy or extra turbid. So just lower it down to where you can't see it and then just bring it right back up so you can start to see this faint white and black outline. So now that we've been out and spent a day sampling on our lakes and reservoirs and also on our streams, there's something important that we want to remember. Um, we want to help prevent the spread of what's called aquatic invasive species. Invasive species are non-native species that have been moved from one place to another by humans either intentionally or unintentionally that cause economic or ecological harm. These are things like zebra mussels, phragmites, uh, Didymo, uh, New Zealand mud snails. These are all examples of organisms that have been unintentionally or unintentionally moved to a new location and they can cause lots of problems for our water quality and in our lakes and in our streams. So it's important that as people who are out monitoring water quality, as students, as recreation people, that we help be part of the solution, not part of the problem. Um, to do that, anything that comes in contact with the water or with the riparian zones alongside of streams or lakes, we need to make sure that we, once we get back at home or at the site, we clean off. So take um, water, rinse everything off, all pieces of mud or plant matter, matter we take off. And then we want to clean, drain, and dry all of our equipment. By doing this, it helps prevent the spread of invasive species from place to place. Um, here in Utah, now our official way to do this is what we say clean, drain, and dry. In the summertime, it takes about seven days uh, for your products to completely clean off. Um, about 18 days in the spring and the summer and up to 30 days in, in the winter time. So it's really important that we do that. Now, if you're going from one water body to another body faster than those allotted drying times, we have 
either professional services to decontaminate things like your boats or large pieces of equipment, or you can use something like 409 or um, HydroQuat, uh, certain types of cleaners that are able to remove all the um, small bits and pieces of organisms that we might not even be able to see that if you go from one lake to another or one river to another river you could potentially transfer these harmful species so make sure you check out either our website or the division of wildlife resources to make sure we're not spreading aquatic invasive species across utah people only like lakes to be one way they like them they like them to be clear blue and have big fish in them they don't want any other ways and some lakes are naturally a little bit more turbid you know this this one is capturing all the runoff you know from this entire area and so you know there's nutrients that run off into it you know you're seeing this floating you know algae on the surface these little bits and pieces and part of it's natural and part of it's the runoff from our farms our cities our towns you know we all live in a watershed and it's important to remember that what happens on land can either positively or negatively influence the quality of the water and everything you know drains somewhere and this is kind of like the end of the line for Cache Valley all the all the water from the south end comes in on the little little bear river everything on the north end comes from the bear river and it goes out into the bear river and eventually all of this water is going to go to the great salt lake and so cache valley is connected to the great salt lake because we're in the same watershed we hope you enjoyed these videos learning how to monitor our lakes and streams we really hope these help you during the envirothon testing and if this is something that you're interested in we have a statewide program called utah water watch that takes citizens students, teachers of all ages from all across the state and helps empower them to monitor our water quality and provide this important data for water quality scientists at the Division of Water Quality and our local NRCS and also our watershed coordinators.